Are you married? Do you have kids, grandkids, great-grandkids? Can you please tell us? There you go. The whole range. Well, you've already given it away. My name's Tony, um, and uh, it's a joy to be here with my wife, Michelle, today. Uh, we have uh, four young adult children. We have uh, a son, 25, uh, a daughter who's 23, coming up 24, I think. Yeah. She's got two grandchildren, so that's our focus now. We're not too worried about when her birthday is. Um, but yeah, she, uh, we have two grandchildren there, and we have a son who's 22 and another son who's 20. Great. That's so exciting, exciting grandparents, yes. Uh, Tony, would you mind telling us, sharing with us, how, how did you become a Christian, and uh, also what keeps you going as a Christian? Mm, okay. Um, so look, I think, um, as I think of that, and perhaps for all of us, that's often a big story, and we haven't got time for that. I'll give you a little bit of a truncated version. Um, I was not brought up in a Christian home, uh, ended up working for a Christian farmer when I was about 17 or 18. And the Spirit of God just did a number on me over this nine-month period, and I started to ask lots of questions uh, of him, uh, all the time kind of thinking, why are you asking? Why do you keep asking questions? Stop asking questions. But I kept asking questions. Um, and I started to read the Bible, in fact, back then um, for a period of time. And then I kind of sensed uh, God was kind of opening my mind and my heart to the truth of, about Jesus, and then I ran away. I ran away for about five years, and um, towards the end of that five years, God just gradually pulled everything out from underneath me, and I ended up on my knees crying out for help. Um, not long after that, he put me in contact with a local church through Sunshine FM counselling line, and uh, I began to learn more and grow more, and yeah, I haven't looked back since, I suppose, in, in, yeah. with ups and downs, of course, yeah. but... Great. Thank you for sharing that with us, Tony. Uh, and lastly, uh, you are the lead pastor of uh, Gosnell's Baptist Church. How can we as a church uh, be praying for the work of the gospel uh, there at Gosnell's Baptist? Yeah, good question. Uh, probably lots of things, but um, we do have our AGM coming up next Sunday. I believe you just had yours, was it last Sunday? Yeah, we, we nailed it. You nailed it. You've already done. You can tick it off and forget about that till next year now. Um, we're doing ours next week, and we do have some significant decisions on there. We're actually wanting to put on a children's work a couple of days a week, so you can pray that people will see the logic of that and the, the gospel reason for that and support that direction. Um, also, just probably things that you pray for here um, that people would grow in their devotion to Jesus, their love for Jesus, their maturity in Jesus, and that people would come to know him from our region. We, we're in Gosnells, um, and the next city is Armadale. Both those twin cities, as we call them, have about 100,000 people in them, and probably much like north of the river, the stats are pretty alarming, maybe 2% who are Christians who go to church and so on, five at best. So there's 190,000 people who don't know Jesus. So you can pray that for us. That'd be good. For sure. Yeah. How about I pray for you now? Is that all right? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Tony and Michelle, and we thank you for their generosity in being with us this morning and bringing us God's word. We thank you for Gosnell's Baptist, Lord, for the work that you have been doing uh, through the people there. Lord, we commit their AGM that's coming up. We pray, Lord, that there'll be a spirit of unity among the body uh, there at Gosnells. We pray, Lord, that uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ will drive all that they do and that there will be clarity in that, Lord, for the people as they see, as they seek to uh, put on a children's worker, that the people there, the body will see the necessity and the rationale behind why uh, this is needed. We pray, Lord, that uh, through, through what you are doing, through Tony and the team there, that you will continue to use them, use them to draw people to you. We pray for those suburbs uh, around Gosnells, Lord. We pray that many would come to know Jesus as the only way, the only truth, and the only life-giving source. So we thank you once again for what you are doing at Gosnells Baptist, and we thank you, Lord, that we, uh, we have Tony here opening up your word. So as we do that now, Lord, please uh, give us um, eyes to see, hearts to obey, and listen to what you have to say to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. I haven't had the chance to, to say good morning. I want to bring you a, a greeting from uh, Gosnells Baptist Church, and particularly from uh, Dani Van Ziel, who many of you know, uh, who I get to work with day, uh, each week. Um, 
And uh, you may or may not know this, but North Coast has been a real blessing to us as a church. We have uh, pillaged, pilfered, and stolen uh, lots and lots of ideas and things that you guys have been doing and working through. You've done the work for us, and then we've just come in and kind of adopted some of those things. So uh, when it, the idea came up uh, about helping out um, by, with a bit of preaching, we didn't have to think about it very long at all to say yes. Um, so we're in Romans 8 today. Again, I don't know what I've done to deserve the privilege of being the one who opens up Romans 8 and actually in a few weeks closes up Romans 8. Um, but nevertheless, that's where we are today. And we're going to read from chapter 8, verse 1 through to verse 11. It's on the screen, but do have it open in your Bible or on your phone um, because it'll disappear from the screen and it would be great if you were able to follow along with me. Romans 8, verse 1, I'm reading from the ESV. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this moment together through Jesus. We come to you asking for the help of your Spirit to bring home your word to us to speak into our lives and to change our lives by your powerful word. We want to confess that we are thirsty and hungry for drink and for food that only you can give. Please help us to come to you in your word for these very things today. We're about to dive into some of the most realities in your word, Lord, the most amazing realities, and we don't want to miss them for our good, and for your glory. So help us, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is a great privilege for me to be with you today, but it's an even greater privilege for us to dive into this part of God's word together today, to begin to explore what many have said is perhaps the greatest chapter in the whole Bible. American blogger Jared Wilson says this of Romans 8. He says, it is the masterpiece within the masterpiece. It's the kryptonite of despair. It is a million floating lanterns released into and against a dark sky. It has been a life-changing blessing to countless believers down through the ages. It has been called the inner sanctuary within the cathedral of the Christian faith. And so I pray and trust that by God's grace here at North Coast Church, that's how you'll see it. That's how you'll experience it over these next few weeks as a church. And friends, it starts from the very first verse. It begins with a stunning declaration in verse one. Stunning declaration. There is therefore now no condemnation for those 
who are in Christ Jesus. You may or may not know, but it actually begins with a stunning declaration and Romans 8 ends with a stunning declaration. This one, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. At the end, in verse 31, it says, no one will be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But we're diving into this one today and we ought to ask the question, how, how is that possible? How is it possible for there to be no condemnation? No condemnation before or from a just and holy God? How, how can that be more than just a nice idea or maybe wishful thinking? Well, where did you land last week with the Apostle Paul in chapter 7? Particularly in light of that, how can this be true? Where did you land last week? Well, you landed with the sobering reality of the seriousness of sin and its power in our lives. You landed where Paul uh, cried out this cry in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Essentially, who will rescue me from the power of sin that I'm held by and the penalty of sin that I'm facing? Uh, clearly Paul's saying, I can't do it myself. I can't break free of it myself. So who will act on my behalf powerfully and deeply? And secondly, that's where you also landed that there's only one source of that deliverance. Verse 25 of chapter 7, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul recognises, though facing the seriousness of his sin, the source of his deliverance. Everything he needs, and therefore everything we need, to deliver us from sin's power and penalty, penalty God actually gives us through Jesus Christ when we turn to him and put our trust in him. That's what your series says, right? Righteous. We need it. God gives it, and we live it. What does it look like, though? How does it happen? How does it shape our lives right here and right now, and what does it mean for the life to come? Well, that's Romans 8 as a whole, but we're just going to look at the first bit again. Look at that stunning declaration again. Therefore, sorry, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How can it be? Well, it's all about location. And we know that location often changes things for us. Where we are, we'll have all sorts of circumstances and realities about that location. I mean, you hear the real estate mantra, don't you? Location, location, location. It's really important that you work out the location because there'll be all sorts of things about that location that are important. Here in chapter 8, verse 1, we have a location that changes everything. It's that little phrase at the end. Therefore, there is no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. This location changes everything. So what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, it means to be united to him by faith. When we turn to him and trust in him, God unites us to his son spiritually by faith. This is essentially what happens to us when we, or for us when we become Christians. So what Paul declares, now no condemnation, depends on our relation to Christ. In fact, everything we have comes through him and flows from him. If we have what's here, if this is true of us, it's because we've come to Jesus in repentance and faith. If we don't have what's here and we want what we see here, we need to come to Jesus in repentance and faith. And so today I want us to see two breathtaking realities that we have if we are in Christ or that we can have if we come to Christ. And the first one is this, and we've seen it already. In Christ, we have a new standing before God. We are free from all condemnation or righteous judgment of God. Free of it. And notice that Paul speaks in the present tense. There is therefore when? Now. Right now. 
right here, right now, as you sit there this morning, in your chair this morning, here in Balcata today, if you are in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. You are free. How? Because God has powerfully acted by his spirit through his son on your behalf and on my behalf. Look at verse two and three. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Before we were in Christ, we were under a law or a power. Paul calls it the law of sin and death. He's not referring to the Mosaic law, although it's kind of expressed there as well. But more broadly, he's speaking of a law or a power or a principle that's been in play from the beginning, from the fall. Ever since sin entered the world and death through sin, this law has been in play. It's the law of sin and death. And it operates like this. Sin is at work in our lives, deep in our hearts, at the core of who we are. And so death reigns over us. Its tyranny overpowers us. As Romans 6.23 has it, the wages of sin is death. Sin and death is a power that is in play and we are all under it, right? As you know full well, because you've probably tried in some way, we cannot actually break free from this power, this law, no matter how hard we try not to sin. No matter what lengths we go to, to kind of ignore the reality of death. Sin overpowers us and death comes for us. We are in very real sense under the law of sin and death. But again, look at what God has done for us. By the work of his spirit in you and through the work of his son for you, he has set you free from this. He has released you or rescued you or delivered you from this, from the law of sin and death. Paul couldn't be clearer in chapter three, sorry, in verse three and the first half about what God has done, could he? For what God, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, that is our sinful nature, could not do. He's done it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. What the law couldn't do because of our sin, it couldn't deliver us life but only death, God has done by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not sinful, but like us, human, fully God, fully man. And why has he sent him in the likeness of sinful flesh? Well, Paul says, for sin, to deal with sin. How did he do that? He condemned sin in the flesh, in Christ. On that cross, he condemned sin. Your sin and my sin in his son. He poured out his justice, his just judgment on him in our place. And so as we turn to Jesus and trust in him to save us from sin and death, our sins are forgiven. Our death is defeated. Our stained and flawed record is taken away and we are given Jesus perfect record and because he was condemned for us condemnation will never come to us now that'll be enough right if that was it that'd be enough i reckon that'd be enough for us to praise god for eternity but there's more than that notice a new law or power comes flooding into our lives By God's grace in Jesus. What's this new power or law? It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. When we turn to Christ and trust in Christ, life floods into us by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Now we relate to God 
through Jesus in the power of the Spirit. This new law or power is now in place in our lives, in operation through our lives, and it overthrows the law of sin and death that was operating there before. The Spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death. And so the stunning declaration of verse 1 is far more than a nice idea, far more than wishful thinking. It's a rock-solid, blood-bought reality because of Jesus. It's breathtaking, isn't it? Don't you think? It's breathtaking what God has done for us in Jesus by his Spirit. I don't know whether you noticed, just in those first two verses, there's a beautiful display of the Trinity at work in our salvation. The Father sends the Son. The Son comes and dies for us, bears our sins in his own body on the tree, takes our condemnation, and the Spirit, brings it home to us, helps us see it, gives us faith to trust in it. This is what God has done, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what we have in Christ. We have a new standing before God. Now, maybe you've heard this illustration before, but it pictures it so well. It's the whole idea of flying. And how that works. Because in flying a plane, there are two laws or two powers in operation, right? There's the law of gravity, and then there's the law of aerodynamics. So let's say, you probably won't be for a while, but let's say you're about to fly to Dubai in an Emirates A380. You're on the tarmac. The law of gravity is in place. In operation. This thing weighs 665,000 kilos. Fully loaded. And while gravity has its way, you are not moving one millimeter off the ground, right? And there's nothing you can do to change that. But then the pilot begins to head down the runway. And as he reaches a certain speed, another law begins to kick in. It's the law of aerodynamics. And as you reach a certain speed, it takes over. And as you hang on to your seat, perhaps with white knuckles, 665,000 kilos begins to fly. The law of aerodynamics at that moment has set you free from the law of gravity. Friends, that's what God has done for us. In Jesus. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has set us free from the law of sin and death. And so in Christ we have a new standing before God. I want to ask you this morning as you sit here, where do you stand before God today? Right here, right now, as you sit here this morning, Where do you stand before God? Is this stunning declaration true of you and true for you? Or to put it another way, have you turned from your sins and trusted in Jesus to forgive you and to give you this new standing before God? It's a really important question that we all must ask because as Psalm 130 has it, If you, O Lord, if God would mark or count or hold us accountable for our iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Answer, it's a rhetorical question, right? No one. But notice verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you. Why? What's What's the trajectory of this forgiveness? That you and I might fear him that we might love him, that we might adore him. And that's exactly what we've seen today. God has graciously and powerfully acted by his spirit through his son on our behalf. There is forgiveness with God. There is no doubt about that because of the cross. So the only question is this, have you come to him for it? 
Where do you stand before him today? Is this stunning declaration true of you and for you? If it isn't, I've got good news for you. It can be, even today, if you will turn from your sins and trust in Jesus dependently to rescue you. If it is true of you today, then do you see how kind and gracious God has been towards you in Jesus? Do you see it? Are you thankful to him for it? Are you joyful in him because of it? Is there a, a longing in your soul to worship him and honor him and praise him? And is there a desire within you to devote your life to him because of the fact that he has set you free from the law of death, sin and death through his son, by his spirit? Do you know, I mean really know, deep down in the core of your being, that he has done that for you? That he has set you free from sin's penalty? That there is no condemnation for you? For, for you? That death cannot and will not hold you if you are in Christ? Do you know that? I, I don't mean it just intellectually. I mean experientially. Do you know that? Yeah, we sing these words, don't we, often? Well, I don't know whether you sing them often. We sing them often, right? No guilt in life. Really? No fear in death. Really? This is the power of Christ in me. Maybe you're here and you're overwhelmed with guilt and shame. You're a follower of Jesus, but guilt has got a grip on you. And shame just feels like it's all over you. Can I ask you, do you need to see the Father afresh? Sending the Son. Do you need to see the Son afresh? On the cross, bearing your sin and shame. For you. Do you need the Spirit of God to bring it home to you afresh? Not so that you can experience salvation because you've already have, but so you can rest in it. That He has set you free from sin's power in your life means that sin also shall have shall no longer have dominion over you. Because of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, you and I can actually fight sin now. And so there's another question. Are you at war with sin in your life? Or are you surrendering to it? Is there kind of a white flag up when it comes to the battle against sin? That's not what God intends, is it? Verse 4 the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. He did all this for this end as well. We who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Uh, finally, on this point, do you notice that it was all of grace? Do you notice that it was all by God's undeserved favor, his undeserved kindness? You and I didn't do anything to kind of earn this, did we? Where were we? We were under the power of sin and death. You and I couldn't do anything about it, but God could, and in his grace, he did. And so we have new standing before God. And secondly, we have in Christ new life from God by his spirit. Now, this is kind of hinted at in verse four, as we've already mentioned, that we're now to walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh when this has happened for us. And clearly Paul is picturing a whole new way of living here, isn't he? The term walk, perhaps you're aware that in the New Testament, that's all about the direction or the trajectory of our lives. And here, this walk is according to the Spirit or by means of the Spirit or enabled by the Spirit. 
In verse 5 to 8, Paul makes it crystal clear that this life is only actually possible by the Spirit. Uh, John Piper says this, Christian living is supernatural living. And Romans 8 would confirm that, wouldn't it? Uh, Paul shows, it, shows it's not possible except by the Spirit, and he does so that with a series of contrasts. See that in verse 5 and following, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And so the point is really clear, isn't it? Without new life from God, we cannot live for God. Worse than that, if we live according to the flesh, all we reap is death. And worse than that, again, if we live according to the flesh, we're actually hostile to God, either overtly or covertly, either passively or aggressively. We are internally opposed to him. We won't honor him. In fact, we can't honor him. But as Paul writes in verse 9, if you're in Christ, that's not true of you. Verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. This is a pivotal point, isn't it, for Paul, as he outlines the Christian life in front of them. So pivotal that he invites them to kind of check themselves. Notice what he goes on to say. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Point being, if you're still in the flesh, you cannot please God. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him, and so you will not be able to live for him. Sure, you might be able to pull off some kind of religious, outwardly moral, relatively upright life. That's pretty scary, don't you think? Because you can do all that and not belong to Christ. Just an aside here, this... this um, this verse has something just very clear to say for us in our day when there's all sorts of thoughts about the Holy Spirit and when you get it and whether you should be filled with the Spirit at a certain point in time or whether there's this kind of, you know, you come to Jesus and then later you're filled with the Spirit. Notice again verse 9b, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So flip that around for a second. If you belong to Christ, you have the Spirit of Christ. It's not now Jesus and later the Spirit. It's not some post-conversion experience that you must speak, seek. It's part of what happens when you come to Jesus in the first place. The Spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. The Spirit of life in Christ takes up residence in you, bringing new life to you, and when that happens... Everything changes. Notice verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Yes, we will face death because of the reality of sin. But if the spirit of, of God is in you, life is flooding into you through him. He is the life-giving spirit of God. Verse 10 to 11. We have new life by the presence of the Spirit, which means a bunch of really awesome things. We are no longer hostile to God. Rather, we love God. We love God. We adore God. We honor God. Not perfectly, but consistently. How did that happen? We were hostile, weren't we? Now we love him. That is the new life that we have in Christ by the Spirit. We no longer rebel against God. We seek to obey him. We want to submit our lives to him. Again, not perfectly, but consistently. We are now in Christ able to live lives that please God. 
And that is our desire. And again, how did that happen? Through the life-giving presence of the Holy Spirit. Again, that would be good enough. That would be enough. But have a look at verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Oh, hang on a minute. Because of the presence of the spirit of God in our life, at some point we are going to experience the same resurrection that Jesus has already experienced. We have new life by the presence of the spirit now and resurrection life by the power of the spirit then. See what God, how awesome it is what God has done for us in Jesus. Well, I'm guessing in a group like this, in a place like Perth, many of you will have watched various uh, different movies that were part of the Marvel series. Um, the Avengers, all those movies, Iron Man. Iron Man, I think, was probably one of my favourites. Um, probably got a bit much after, was it Iron Man 3 or something? I don't know. But if I ask you this question this morning, what is the most important thing that Iron Man needs to be who he is? Eh, we might get a bunch of different answers. Some might say his suit. Some might say his secretary. Others might say something else. But it's actually this. It's actually his arc reactor that he must have to be who he he is. If that thing slots into the uh, slot in his chest, he is Iron Man. Without that, he's just Tony Stark. Uh, it's no good for him if that thing is sitting over detached from him on the bench. But if it's slotted into the center of his, his chest, then he is Iron Man. Without it, he's lifeless. In fact, if you know the script, he's gradually dying. Friends, without the life-giving presence of God's Spirit, we are not only under the law of sin and death, we are lifeless and we are dying. We are hostile to God, we are unwilling to please God and unable to please God. But in and through Christ, when we come to Him and trust in Him, the Spirit of life comes to dwell in us and brings us new life from God. So let me ask you today, how are you going about living for Jesus in the day to day? Are you depending on the Spirit of God to live for the glory of God? Remember what Piper said? Christian living is supernatural living. Is that how you're seeking to live it out? Daily depending on the Spirit of God? If you are in the Spirit, if you are a Christian, having turned to Jesus in dependent trust, you have, through his presence in your life, the capacity to fight sin and live for him. You'll never do it in your own strength. But get this, friends, and you'll see it next week in the next section of Romans. Sin was that which at one point brought death to you. Now, in Christ, by the Spirit, you and I are able to bring death to it. Friends, do we see the beauty of the good news of Jesus today? It's incredible, isn't it? What else could do that for us? There's nothing else like it in all the world. Nor has there ever been. This is astonishingly good news for our world. To those who are overwhelmed with guilt and failure and brokenness and shame, through Jesus it's possible to, for these words to be true of you. There is now no condemnation. In him we can have a new standing before God. To those who have given up, 
who think real and lasting change is just a mirage, who have tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. There is a way of living that is surprising to all of us, if we're honest. It's according to the Spirit, and in Him we can have new life from God. Righteous. We need it. God gives it. <laughs>